This video is mostly for me, a way to collect and express my thoughts and feelings about what's going on in the world and our current state of reality. I've also had many friends abroad contact me about what's going on here in Florida and the United States in general. So this can help serve as a partial response to that and begin to help understand my point of view on the whole situation. For anyone else who happens to listen to this, I'm not a doctor or a healthcare worker. I'm not a constitutional lawyer, a public health expert, or medical professional of any kind. Really, I'm nobody, and you are under no compulsion to listen to me. If you don't like what I'm saying, please change the channel at any time. This is for entertainment purposes only. So first of all, to all my friends and extended family across the world, I'm fine. My immediate family's fine. All my friends are fine. Thank goodness. Out of the many hundreds of people that I know across dozens of countries, I personally know of only one individual in the past four months who has had a confirmed diagnosis of the thing, which I will not name due to the enormous emotional and metaphysical weight already attached to the name itself. For anyone who has even a rudimentary understanding of magic and spelling, they will understand this choice on much deeper levels. But more on that perhaps another video. From here on out, I'll refer to it as the crown. I first heard about the crown about the end of last year or so. I remember watching with increasing alarm and horror at the videos coming out of China. I wasn't necessarily concerned by the crown itself at the time, but rather the response to it. I saw people being welded inside their apartments, kidnapped off the streets by men in masks and white coats, kicking and screaming while being thrown into a van and taken away. Hazmat teams bursting into office buildings and other businesses, spraying huge clouds of who knows what onto the people in there, and imposing extremely harsh punishments on those who dared to go outside without government permission. I saw terrified groups of humans not only afraid and suspicious of each other, but of themselves as well, because a condition like this turns everyone into both a victim and a suspect, simultaneously and indefinitely. The added element of masks and hazmat gear almost completely removed all semblance of our humanity, which is the basis for almost all atrocity on a mass scale. And knowing what we know about brutal dictatorships, having studied political science for over a decade under the tutelage of professors such as James Carville and others at Tulane University, I knew right away that the crown can and would be used by perverse officials and corrupt authorities to extend and tighten their power, to remove their rivals and enemies, and to control their subjects based on fear and violence, all in the name, of course, of public health. What I found perhaps more disturbing was the fact that even after it came out a while ago now, from experts such as Forrest Galante on the Discovery Channel and others, that there were actually no bats sold in the local market when this first broke out, and that it is actually extremely difficult for a virus to jump from species to species, that no one really knew where this thing came from or how it all got started, yet hardly anyone I knew, and certainly nobody in power or in the mainstream media, was questioning the official narrative that someone just ate a bowl of bat soup and kicked off this whole calamity. Many discussions about the crown and its implications just completely bypassed the origin story altogether, which I think we can all agree is critically important to understanding the situation, learning the most from it, and preventing it from ever happening again on this scale. But when I found out that there was a high-tech virology lab just up the street from the epicenter of this outbreak, and no one really seemed to be talking about this, or just dismissed it as conspiracy, then the red flags really began to fly. Only now, in mid-April of 2020, is the mainstream press and some of the public beginning to question the official narrative and wondering just how the heck all of this got started. But let me zoom back in to my personal experience for just a moment. So I estimate our personal circle to be around 500 friends, family, other acquaintances that I keep up with on a fairly regular basis. I'm grateful that out of all these people, there has so far been only one with a confirmed case of the crown. This particular person, thank goodness, happens to be doing amazingly well, posting videos of themselves on social media, doing push-ups and sit-ups, and for all the years I've known them, really looking to be in the best shape that I've ever seen them. Now let me stop right there and allow you, the listener, to observe within yourself 
all the knee-jerk objections and mental chatter which may have popped up immediately after listening to this anecdote. In previous conversation about the crown, I have been met with all sorts of emotionally charged responses about freezer trucks and overwhelmed hospitals and an almost frantic insistence that my personal experience should be disregarded in favor of a hysterical generalization of the situation, and that somehow I wasn't taking this seriously enough. I found this to be rather peculiar as well because out of my entire circle of friends and family, there was hardly anyone amongst them who knew anyone at all adversely affected by the crown, even after it was allowed to spread across the world, basically unchecked, for over three months in some of the most densely populated places on earth. So as the hysteria and panic continued to increase in the media, with live update death counts ticking away on the screen like some sort of horrible scoreboard, ghastly images of people on gurneys and isolation bubbles, and state and local governments begin to forcibly close all non-essential businesses, my own employer included, I noticed that there was really nobody talking about the very basis for all human health, which is, of course, the food we eat, the things we watch and listen to, a reduction of stress, and our relationship to ourselves, each other, and the natural world. I could not believe that parks were forced to close without any previous incidents, but liquor stores stayed open, that purely carcinogenic products such as cigarettes were untouched by the government's reach, but public beaches were deemed too dangerous to use. If this was a number game, I thought, and if these unprecedented authoritarian measures with incalculable financial and emotional consequences were being enacted to save as many lives as possible, then why weren't we going after the leading preventable causes of death such as heart disease, which can mostly be attributed to poor diet and lifestyle, and instead focusing the conversation on a vaccine that was seemingly a lifetime away from being developed with no guarantee of its efficacy or safety whatsoever. But I'm not holding my breath for any SWAT raids on fast food joints or expect the tobacco conglomerates to come out and say, hey, we're just gonna not produce any more poison smoke products that kill millions of people both directly and indirectly every single year, which would seemingly be a smart thing to do in general, but especially in the middle of a virulent respiratory disease. So, as I lost my job, I began shopping for some of the elderly residents in my community and witnessed, comically at first, but with increasing disbelief, people in the grocery store that were so utterly terrified that they'd show up wearing bathing suit bottoms on their face as a mask, and others wearing the entire costume of fear, buying toxic food, alcohol, all sorts of other poisonous crap to put in their bodies. <laughs> well, they, you know, they're just going to go forced to stay at home with not much to do other than sit around and watch the never-ending parade of misery on the news. I found I had to be really careful with who I confided in with these concerns about the irrationality and backwardsness of these new policies and measures. When questioning someone as to how they could still possibly support factory farming practices after all these viruses connected to systemic and brutal animal abuse in wet markets and slaughterhouses, the responses I usually got were nonsensical, contradictory, ad hominem, hypocritical, and downright idiotic. But this I attribute mostly to a relentless campaign of pro-animal abuse propaganda present from our very birth. It took me years to personally overcome, and reminded me of the old adage that you cannot, by logic, get someone out of a position that they did not, by logic, get themselves into. So as it stands now, we find ourselves as a species forced into a worldwide traumatic experience, which is both bringing us together and tearing us apart. As factions of pro and anti-lockdown camps continue to grow louder and louder, as 20 million Americans have filed for unemployment in the last month alone, and the World Health Organization claims now that since they've kicked everyone off the streets, they are considering breaking into people's homes and removing people, and I quote, who may be sick and taking them away, with dignity, of course. This, we know, will probably never fly in a place like the United States of America without complete martial law on federal, state, and local levels, and I imagine we would see widespread violent carnage before any of that was put into place. I am an advocate for peace, always, and I've personally sworn an oath of nonviolence. but if anyone tried to force their way into my home to take away my mother, away on suspicion of being ill, saying that I would not be allowed to visit her or even attend her funeral, God forbid, if something really happened, then that's an oath I would seriously reconsider. 
And if I was a parent and some stranger in a mask and uniform came to my house to take my children away because they were merely suspected to have the crown, then I would probably throw that oath right out the window along with the people who came to abduct my children. We must be extremely vigilant that the devastation of the treatment shall not exceed the devastation of the condition being treated. Think about it. So I would like my friends and family and anyone else who hears this to zoom out of the situation for just a moment, take a hard look at the hard numbers of the crown, not the suspected numbers or the projected numbers, find out how those numbers were calculated and wonder if we're all going about this correctly and consider if you should seriously re-examine your trust in your media as well as your government. But I would like to personally thank Governor Ron DeSantis for not turning Florida into a fascist police state and to thank the President of the United States of America for allowing the states to govern themselves rather than dictate a single strategy for an infinitely complex system of parts and unique circumstances within the states themselves. And if those two statements made you really angry, I once again invite you to pause to look within yourself. I know in my heart that we're all going to be just fine as a collective after this, even with so much death and suffering in our midst, and I hope we can all reject fear in favor of facts and knowledge to be our own health advocates and reporters on the truth and to stop all this absurdly insane partisan two-party bickering bullshit that the founders of this country direly warned us about all those years ago. I love you all. Stay well. Thanks for listening.